What's going on everyone? This is Kunal from Altcoin Buzz and today we're going to go over consensus mechanisms. So first of all, what is a consensus mechanism? So when we talking about Bitcoin and blockchain, we're talking about decentralized cryptocurrencies and a technology that is decentralized. So when you have decentralized technology, especially when you're talking about payments and verifications and having a distributed ledger, you need a method in order for all of these decentralized nodes on this network to come together and decide and have a consensus on what is you know the correct ledger what is the correct you know sequence of data and what is the correct data that we're going to move forward with on the network and that's where a consensus mechanism comes from so Investopedia describes a consensus mechanism as a fault tolerant mechanism that is used in computer and blockchain systems to achieve the necessary agreement on a single data value or a single state of the network among distributed processes or multi-agent systems it is useful in record keeping among other things so here's many different forms of consensus mechanisms that we can go over so we'll start with proof of work so proof of work is the consensus mechanism for bitcoin right now and proof of work is described in bitcoin wiki as a piece of data which is difficult costly or time consuming to produce but easy for others to verify and which satisfies certain requirements against these certain requirements are what the consensus has agreed are the requirements in order to verify the transactions and the ledger and the data on the network so producing a proof of work can be a random process with low probability or so that a lot of trial and error is required on average before a valid proof of work is generated and then Bitcoin uses the hash cash proof of work system so the way hash cash proof of work system is is that Bitcoin uses data integrity or the SHA-256 hashing algorithm in order to verify these transactions and the way proof of work works is you use the computational processing power of all the computers connected to the network to verify the transactions and they all go through to get a copy of the latest distributed public ledger so proof of stake came about as a result of the problems with proof of work so proof of work had many big problems first of all it's very um, you know not economical so what that means is you know you got to have all this big you know advanced hardware you know a6 and all this other stuff to run on the on the network and it's really you know something that that's you know going to consume a lot, of, a lot of electricity and you know you got to have a lot of them to even make a profit especially on something like bitcoin where you have you know thousands if not millions of nodes on the network and the other part is you know it's not very eco-friendly you know it, it many countries don't even use the amount of power that the bitcoin network uses so introducing proof of stake so the proof of stake system is attracting a lot of attention these days with even ethereum switching over to the system from the proof of work system proof of stake is an alternative process for transaction verification on a blockchain it is increasing in popularity and being adopted by several cryptocurrencies so they go on to describe proof of work but then we get when we get into proof of stake so unlike the proof of work system in which the user validates transactions and creates new blocks by performing a certain amount of computational work a proof of stake system requires the user to show ownership of a certain number of cryptocurrency units so this is why it's really popular there are a lot of proof of stake coins dash being one of the big ones where all you have to do is own the coin and then have it ha hosted on a wallet that's connected to the network and you can earn more coins and the pro the proof is you have those coins and you are staking them in your wallet so just by having them in your wallet you can earn more of them so it's that's why it's so popular the consensus method comes from the the individuals and the nodes who are holding the the asset in their wallet so the creator of a new block is chosen in a pseudo random way depending on the user's wealth also defined as stake so the more coins you have the greater chance you have that you will be choosing the, the the new block to be verified in the proof of stake system blocks are said to be forged or minted not mined 
Users who validate transactions and create new blocks in the system are referred to as forgers. So that's why cryptocurrencies like Dash are really popular because not only are they used to, for financial transactions, but they have this great way to stake your coins if you're not using them right now and earn more of them. So then there's a delegated proof of stake version too. And it's basically described as technological democracy. So this article right here saying by Hacker Noon says explain delegated proof of stake like I'm five. And it really does a good job of that actually. So just think about how many asshole bosses there are out there in the world. Have you ever wanted a system in which you, the employee, get to fire your own incompetent boss? Well, that's how delegated proof of stake works. What happens is a bunch of nodes on the network select one node to act as their delegate. And that node is going to represent the rest of the nodes. And if the rest of the nodes feel that one node is doing a good job verifying transactions and representing their side part of the network well, they'll continue on with that node as the delegate for the proof of stake. If not, then that node will be replaced. And it's really a nice democratic way to run a network, a decentralized network. So there are many other forms of, you know, proof for of proof for any form of work on the network. And one of them is introduced by Quanstamp called proof of caring. And the way proof of caring works is you receive airdrops based on social media interactions. So when they talk about proof of caring, they really mean about they're trying to get after the ethos of the network. They're really trying to say, okay, all the people who went on social media and liked and followed our, uh, you know, our tweets and, uh, you know, subscribed and, you know, f and, you know, went on certain other social media and were very active. And if they can show proof of that, they will get the airdrop. And that's really proof of caring. It's about how much, you know, activity are you doing to care about this project and helping it grow? And Quantstamp has really pioneered this project. And it really is not bad, not a bad way to earn airdrops just by doing some work on social media. So in a, in not a, not an unsimilar way, proof of importance introduced by NEM, right? What they are is essentially using this this system this consensus mechanism that is based on productive network activity so if you can prove to the network that you have done productive network activity which means you know sending and receiving a lot of nem or you know doing financial transactions with nem or buying nem you are being very active on the nem blockchain uh, in terms of transactions and acting on the network and so based on that proof of importance and your importance you can be verified on the network and that's how you can be you know you have us you need to have a certain amount of balance so 10,000 nem in their balance and that's how you can be eligible for proof of importance so now let's get into some of the more even more technically advanced um ones so neo uses this one it's called byzantine fault tolerance all right, so Byzantine fault tolerance is a very complicated topic, but let's try to make it really simple here. So first, two questions are asked. Number one, what happens when an attacker decides to not follow the rules and to tamper with the state of his ledger? And number two, what happens when these actors are a large part of the network, but not the majority? So in order to create a secure consensus protocol, it must be fault tolerant. So first, let's talk about the two generals problem. So it describes a scenario where two generals are attacking a common enemy. And general one is considered the leader and the other is considered the follower. Each general's army on its own is not enough to defeat the enemy army successfully. Thus, they need to cooperate and attack at the same time. This seems like a simple scenario, but there is one caveat. In order for them to communicate and decide on a time, General 1 has to send a messenger across the enemy's camp that will deliver the time of the attack to General 2. However, there is a possibility that the messenger will get captured by the enemies and thus the message won't be delivered. This will result in General 1 attacking while General 2 and his army hold their ground. 
even if the first message goes through, General 2 has to acknowledge that he received the message. So he sends a messenger back, thus repeating the previous scenario where the messenger gets can get caught. This extends to infinite acknowledgments, and thus the generals are unable to reach an agreement on when they would attack. So that's the two generals problem. Let's now get into the Byzantine generals problem. So it's similar to the two generals problem, but with a twist. It describes the same scenario where instead more than two generals need to agree on a time to attack their common enemy. The added complication here is that one or more of the generals can be a traitor meaning that they can lie about their choice. Like, they say they can attack, agree to attack at 0900, but instead they do not attack at that time. So the leader-follower paradigm described in the two generals problem is transformed to a commander-lieutenant setup. In order to achieve consensus here, the commander and every lieutenant must agree to the same decision and, uh, and to, for simply attacking or retreating. So it gets interesting that if the commander is a traitor, consensus must still be achieved. As a result, all lieutenants take the majority vote. So the algorithm to reach consensus in this case is based on the value of majority of the decisions a lieutenant observes, and that's called Byzantine fault tolerance. So even if one of the, the key nodes is a, a, an attack node and not actually working positively on the network, you can still outnumber them by getting a majority. Uh, using the good nodes. So that's Byzantine fault tolerance. And it solves the Byzantine generals problem. That hence the name. So then what is delegated Byzantine fault tolerance? And this goes into what Neo offers. Right? So just to make it clear when we're talking about these consensus methods, these new ones, these new consensus mechanisms, they are a response to the idea of decentralization and democratization. So proof of work, um, you, you know, uh, as many people argue that a lot of miners in China have centralized, you know, the proof of work method by controlling a vast majority of the CPU processing power. So having stuff like delegated Byzantine fault tolerance as an alternative consensus mechanism is really important in many people's eyes to really providing a democratic way to achieve consensus on the network. So many people talk about these previous algorithms that are recognized as being useful. You know, some developers are looking for even better solutions. It's not hard up, not hard to come up with a concept that has been tr tried yet in the world of cryptocurrency. Delegated Byzantine fault tolerance is one of those algorithms that very few projects actively use. Neo uses it, but it certainly has its merits. So we talked about the Byzantine generals problem. So by using delegated Byzantine fault tolerance, the relation the relationship between different blockchain nodes is rearranged. More specifically, the entire network becomes almost invulnerable to the Byzantine generals problem, while still being able to achieve consensus if malicious nodes would attempt to cause harm. If to do so, one needs to acknowledge the different entities who make up the ecosystem. On the one hand, there are professional node operators who run a node as a way to gain extra income. On the other hand, we have the users who want to explore all features of a particular cryptocurrency ecosystem that, in, that that particular cryptocurrency ecosystem has to offer. Acknowledging both groups of ecosystem members is of the utmost importance, especially when it comes to securing an ecosystem. So the consensus part of the DBFT, or Delegated Byzantine Fault Tolerance Protocol, occurs through a gamified form of block verification among professional node operators. So all of these professional nodes are appointed by ordinary nodes through a delegated voting process. And the professional node broadcasts its version of the blockchain to the network. If 66% of the other nodes agree with this information, consensus is achieved. Should this threshold not be met, a different professional node is appointed to broadcast its blockchain version until consensus can be established. So not only does this delegated Byzantine fault tolerance system prove to be a little bit more fault tolerant than say a proof of work because you need 66% consensus, not just 50.1% consensus, but it really works well because it allows all the nodes on the network to have a, a, a you know very even and democratic say more than other forms of consensus in achieving full consensus on the network or majority consensus. So that's delegated Byzantine fault tolerance.
There's one more consensus method, and it's called asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerance. And what asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerance is, is it's for hash graph, right? So what, a, what they're trying to do is they're trying to increase the speed of transactions. So one of the problems with delegated Byzantine fault tolerance is there's an issue of, well, will it be able to scale to as much capability as you would want it to, to be mass adopted? So what asynchronous does, the, we allow for the possibility of some messages between honest members being delayed arbitrarily long or even not making it through to their intended recipients at all. So, right? So some DLTs are unable to achieve consensus under this assumption. So they may claim to support partially asynchronous um, Byzantine fault tolerance where messages are never delayed by more than a certain period of time and always get through by that deadline. But today's reality is that many kinds of attackers can prey on exactly this assumption to either bring a network to its knees or disrupt the order of transactions. So the, re the reality is that there can be botnets or DDoS attacks and malicious firewalls interfering with the messages. So these are issues that many real world deployments of Byzantine fault tolerances will face. So we, a partially asynchronous B Byzantine fault tolerance will not provide for reliable systems in the, in the long run. So by allowing for these real world faults and still keeping the high speed, that's what asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerance achieves to do, right? So what they're saying is their ledger should be able to guarantee consensus will be achieved that we know that we know it when it happens and that we will all reach the same consensus and do so even under realistic assumptions about malicious nodes and network errors. And they, they'll, they're saying that they'll be able to provide a, a very high level of transparency and, and security to users and that these systems will deliver on their promises to provide a more trustworthy system of distributed consensus. So there's this, uh, there's this paper here by KPMG, a really big auditing firm, and they talk about consensus, immutable agreement for the Internet of Value. And this, um, which I'm not going to read in full because it's going to take forever, but uh, I will link it in the description below, and I really want you guys to, to take a look at it if you have the time, because it really does go into detail of un helping the, the, um, the, the person who's reading it understand consensus and understand, you know, how blockchain, what's the purpose of blockchain for your, um, you know, business? So many people are asking the question, why blockchain, right? There are many different businesses out there and many different industries and people are many different people are seem to say, hey, it's just like a gold rush. A lot of people are just creating tokens and tokenizing their their product or creating a token just to get on the hype train or get on the money train of cryptocurrency. And this article really gives you some perspective and understanding or this article. This um, paper will really help you get, get an understanding in you know especially when they get to is blockchain right for your organization try to understand why someone would you know someone would choose blockchain for their project and then finally they talk about consensus mechanism valuation and it really does have, try to get you to understand how consensus mechanisms are valuable to companies and which consensus mechanism would, would, would works best for them and how they weigh the different consensus mechanisms. So this really is a great option for them. And so again, uh, thank you guys for listening. Remember, you guys can follow us at Twitter on AllCoinBuzz.io. You guys can also follow AllCoinBuzzLadies here. Um, under the uh, the handle a b u z z underscore ladies, right? So we also have the altcoin buzz dot io website, where we keep you up to date on what's going on, and we have many podcasts and blog posts on what's going on. So and finally, we have a Steam it altcoin buzz, where you guys can basically earn Steam dollars, which is a cryptocurrency just by liking and commenting on our videos and uploading them. So thank you very much, guys, and we'll see you on the next video.